Paranormal Survivor, Evelyn's Evil House. Take one. Mark. My three boys, Travis, William, and Jeremy, and myself moved into the home. It was an old farmhouse and um, very open fields. And during the springtime, it was cornfields, things like that. Um, very old country scene. On the first day that we saw the house, we met the realtor there. Yeah, it's beautiful. Do you guys want to go take a look inside? Oh, yeah. She opened up the door and let us go in. And I asked her, I said, are you coming? And the first thing she said to us was, I'm not going in there. That house gives me the creeps. Me and my brothers, I knew we all loved how the house was, but that's before we found out about the things within. The house had been empty for nine months. The last set of people who actually lived in the house disappeared after three months. The realtor didn't speak very much of the people who had previously been there, just that they were there for three months and had disappeared and hadn't come back. Once we got inside the house and was able to walk around and go room to room, um, you could feel like a heaviness. Like breathing heavy in the house. Evelyn had misgivings, but the size and location of the house were perfect. So she decided to take it and she and the boys moved in. After seeing the house the first time and being able to move in, uh, my opinion was still really exciting. We were glad to be there. Mom, do you think I love it here? We, we have to do it. I, I At first, I, it seemed like you'd get the feeling that you're being watched. Ah, you jerk. Like you'd have to always be cautious about where you are. Boys. We'll finish this later. Here we will. The very first night in the house, um, I can remember laying in my bed, and the rooms were pitch dark, and there was a vent on the floor beside it. You could hear music, like from 1930s to 1940s, coming from a phonograph. It was almost as if you could picture somebody at a ball, and I could hear it plain as day. There were no lyrics. There were nobody saying anything. It was just instrumental, and all you could hear was the sound of it. When I realized it was coming through the vent from the floor, I got extremely scared. I yelled at my boys to stop playing that music. Hearing the music at night would creep me out because my, my room would be pitch dark, no light or nothing in there at night. I thought it was coming from the vents or downstairs in the rooms. I wouldn't be able to say what was causing the music because I knew we didn't own any sort of old music players or anything like that. I'm coming up. I got out of bed and actually went upstairs. And there was nobody there, and William was asleep in his room. I was sick to my stomach and a little bit nervous. Shortly after that, the music faded away. I was scared, very, very scared. Strange music wasn't the only eerie thing about the house. Probably be around 12 or 1 in the morning. I was trying to sleep, and I heard the sound of the ball bouncing down the stairs. It was really loud. It literally sounded like a uh, the ball bouncing literally sounded like a, 
a bouncy ball hitting the wall over and over. I could hear the bouncing of like a rubber ball and you can literally hear it hitting the floor. The next day, I had actually asked the boys if they had heard anything, and my son Jeremy actually looked at me and said, are you talking about the little girl? And that's when I was like, what little girl? My brother Jeremy told me about this little girl that he saw, the little girl with black hair and like wore a white dress and would always be in his doorway just watching him sleep. We had actually bought a small rubber ball um, and put it in the hallway because we wanted to do like our own experiment to see if the bouncing ball we would hear at night would actually move. We would put the ball at one end of the hallway and see what happened to it throughout the night. And as soon as we did that, it was almost like an open door that, hey, she was being allowed to play. Uh, the ball literally would roll down the hallway by itself. Children's spirits are innocent like children in life. Child spirits will want to engage with people. They want to engage with other children, and they're going to want to play with the objects. So if children have toys at home, they're going to want to play with them just as if they were alive. I felt bad for the little girl. I, I just felt like she was lonely, like she needed someone to know that she was there. I don't think possibly she was old enough to understand that she no longer lived. The ball wasn't the only plaything for the spirit of the little girl. I absolutely loved antiques, and I inherited an antique baby carriage. And it would start rolling across the carpet. As soon as I saw the carriage move, it made me freak out a little bit. And I kind of threw something at the carriage to make it knock over. I felt that if this little girl was upstairs laughing and playing, she had to be laughing and playing with somebody. I instantly had a gut feeling that there was more than one person there. A few nights later, Evelyn's fears would prove to be well-founded. I remember laying there in bed and, of course, pulling the blankets up over my head because I was a little scared and I couldn't understand why. I mean, I had a real shaky feeling. And when I looked up, even in a dark room, you could see nothing but a big black figure. Evelyn Martin and her three sons found what they thought was the perfect home. But not long after moving in, they began to experience strange paranormal activity. Soon, it escalated into pure terror. When I looked up, even in a dark room, you could see nothing but a big black figure. I was completely sick to my stomach. I was nervous, and I remember I pulled the blankets up over my head and said, just go away. I wasn't sure what it was when I looked at it. I sat up and I screamed. Evelyn wasn't the only one in the family to come face to face with the negative spirit. One night in particular, Travis had been asleep. I could hear him yelling, get off of me, get off of me. Gosh, I'll never forget that. I went running up the steps and I was like, Travis, what's wrong, what's wrong? And he sat up off of his bed, and he was just pale. I said, what's wrong? He said, my chest is killing me. He said, I couldn't move. I tried to get off the bed. He said, and I was stuck.
I knew that I needed to get help, that I needed somebody to tell me what was going on. Evelyn called in paranormal investigator John Hines and his team. Hi. When Evelyn and I first spoke, at that time, we were talking about the activity that she was having. It had her upset, especially because it was involving her boys. So, you know, we set up a time to bring the team out When we did the research on Evelyn's home, what we did find out was that there had been a house fire. There's a pretty good possibility that whatever's going on here probably stems from something that happened at that fire. A traumatic event such as a house fire can cause a haunting because there's a huge expulsion of energy at that time, which creates almost a ripple effect, and that can cause entities to be sucked in or become attached to the location. It felt like it was 100 degrees in there. And you just felt like the walls were pushing in on you. It was almost like the feeling that you're sitting in the middle of 100 people just trying to stare you out of the house. Using a K2, we were able to find an area of, um, of uh, energy that seemed to be about the size of a, of a human child, maybe about four feet tall and roughly about the dimensions that a, a child would be. You could walk room to room, and then you could almost tell that, hey, there's somebody here. Evelyn had an antique uh, baby carriage. And wouldn't you know, we got down to the bottom of the steps, and this thing had, had moved maybe three or four feet from where it, it had been originally. The carriage only went like a few feet at a time. It's not like it would go all over the place. It would move as if somebody nudged it and it would roll. I didn't even have an explanation for it. The only thing I could think of was that the little girl that wanted to play ball was playing with the carriage. And a moment later, we heard a commotion upstairs. We got in there and immediately picked this thing up again. The interesting thing is while we were in there, our uh, EMF meter started going crazy. So we tried an EVP session in that room. Uh, can you see the needle on the IR? What we were getting was an, uh, a fast oscillating screech from it. Let's check it out. Is that okay? It was burying the needle and just uh, this loud, almost warble. It was almost like a police siren going off. Something we had never, ever heard come from an EM EMF meter. Just one more room and then we'll pack up and we'll go home. It was a really active, really active night. And while we were doing that, we actually got an EVP, a really good EVP of what sounds like a little girl saying, what do you want? When John told us that there was a little girl in the house, that's when I realized like, maybe it is the same little girl that my brother was seeing in the rooms. And that just really frightened me, because out of all the rooms, mine was most likely to be the little girl's room. Concerned with the level of paranormal activity, John decided to push the investigation a step further. We were all gathered in the living room during the investigation, and John had placed a flashlight on my coffee table. He had said, you know, I know we know that you're here, and can you turn the flashlight on? We had asked several questions. One of them was uh, a question we restated a couple times, asking whether whatever was there meant any kind of harm to Evelyn and the boys. And it did uh, give us an affirmative, which meant that, you know, it turned the flashlight on. And then when we asked it if it would turn the light off, it did turn the light off, and it did that uh, twice. Whatever it is, it is right here in this corner. If I move up. Our uh, psychic was able to verify that, you know, she was picking up on two entities. One that she did feel was a child. The other one she felt was uh, something more dangerous. She felt that it was a male 
of some kind. The scary one that was there, um, whomever it was or whatever it was, it, it wasn't good. <laughs> Evelyn Martin and her sons were being terrorized by spirits in their home. After calling in paranormal experts to help, they made a frightening discovery. I believe it had a potential to become a danger. I think it was escalating. John felt it was necessary to have the house cleansed, uh, to make sure that there was nothing evil, nothing bad, um, nothing else that would be harmful to myself and my sons. It is so, so important to cleanse your space when you find out there's something evil or demonic in your space because you want to gain it back. You want your property. And the longer that you leave this, the more detrimental it's going to be to your health or your family. Our psychic medium handles it. Uh, she will walk through a home with the Bible. Um, she will burn some sage as she's walking through the home and we'll read some uh, uh, scripture from the Bible uh, along with asserting the fact that, you know, you know, anything here that should not be here, this activity, whatever's going on, needs to stop and you need to go. Following the cleanse, the negative energy was successfully banished from the home. Mom, can you hurry up? But some spirits still remained. After the cleansing was done, we followed up with um, Evelyn. I can't say that things had completely stopped, but she sounded a lot happier, a lot more positive. Kind of feel like the vibe changed to where I didn't have to be scared to be in my own house anymore. I just felt like I could honestly just relax without being cautious all the time. After this was done, it was completely different. Um, wasn't afraid to be at home by myself. I wasn't afraid to sleep with my door open. The boys were like back to normal. They weren't on edge or upset about anything or not, God, not sleeping at night. After that happened, it was almost as if whatever was bad there knew it had to go and it was gone. Haunted by a paranormal entity can be a traumatic experience. But when it's a young child being attacked by an evil spirit, the consequences are truly horrifying. Paranormal Survivor, interview with Crystal Martin. Take one. Marky. The house that I grew up in had a large front yard and a large backyard. It was uh, three bedrooms, one bathroom, full basement, full-size house. And I had a lot of really strange, strange things that happened to me there. For Crystal and her sister Carrie, the paranormal experiences began at an early age. Around four years old, I, I started to feel fear and terror in that house. It was from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed in the house, fear. I heard lots of banging noises and they were like bang, bang little light and then bang bang and then like bang bang like shaking my closet doors the unexplained noises soon escalated into something far more terrifying I woke up and I rolled over and in my hallway, there was 
a man in a brown suit. He had dark hair, dark, dark features. Looking in his eyes, there was nothing there. It was just empty. My impression of the man was that he was evil. And he, he smiled and he turned around toward my sister's room and disappeared. The only other person that saw that man in the house would be my sister. And she said he went to attack her. He looked like somebody that you would not trust in the street. He looked like somebody that had been in jail multiple times and would prey on kids or whoever. Malevolent things are attracted to the innocence of children. And children, they're easy targets. They're easy to fool. They're easy to get an invitation from. And once the invitation has been made, you have a problem. I woke up and I went, went in the room and that was it, he was gone. For the next few years, Crystal kept experiencing the nighttime apparitions. The man would appear to me almost every night. He would do things like just be in different places of the room, smiling at me and laughing with a, like one of those really deep laughs. <laughs> to lock eyes with him was torture because there was nothing there. It was just a big void. When, when I seen him, I couldn't do anything. I was frozen in fear. I could not speak. I tried, and nothing came out. I was just so terrified that I shut down. It's like paralyzing fear. Go away. It didn't take long for the attacks to become more violent. He had a knife, and he was trying to cut me all over. And I thought I was literally having parts of my body taken off. <laughs> there was uh, cuts that I actually did have on my leg, and they were all in a line. It was just like boom, 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 boom. Just cuts like that. To see the physical evidence, there's no words. It's beyond terrified. It was torture, really. A spirit can cause physical injuries like deep cuts if they are strong. If they're that angry, if they're that evil, they're going to cause physical harm. This was an extremely scary incident for me. I felt that I was in serious danger, like that I was going to be killed. Soon, even the daylight hours ceased to be safe. When I first walked downstairs in the morning, I would see rotted skeletons hanging from the ceiling. Nine-year-old Crystal Martin was being terrorized by an evil and violent entity. But Crystal's suffering would only get worse as the horror intensified. When I first walked downstairs in the morning, I would see rotted skeletons hanging from the ceiling. They were hanging from the ceiling by the ropes around their neck. The skeletons looked like people that had been, that had either been killed or died, like they were decomposing. They just looked insane. They looked, wow. They looked evil, very, very evil. They were terrifying to me because I was awake. It was just horrible. I think there was a connection between the man in the brown suit and the skeletons. The 
The horrifying apparitions were pushing Crystal to her breaking point. One night I woke up and uh, that man in the brown suit was there once again. And I asked him straight out, What do you want from me? <laughs> He looked at me, and he laughed, and he turned and wrote KILL in capital letters in red on my bedroom wall. He was writing with just his finger, and it was red. The words were red, so I assumed it was blood. When he was finished writing that on the wall, he had this really weird, eerie smile on his face. And he literally dropped. Boom, gone. I thought he was under my bed. I started crying and yelling for help. Crystal! Hi. My babysitter came up and she just said, you're just having a dream, go back to sleep. She didn't believe me. To know my babysitter didn't believe me, it made me feel just horrible inside and it made me feel like I couldn't trust her or go to her. So I quickly rolled back in my bed facing the wall with my blankets over my head and I just was like holding them really, really tight. And that's the way I stayed till morning. I didn't move, I didn't roll over nothing. I didn't even go back to sleep. After that, I felt like I was being watched. The constant fear and terror took a toll on Crystal. Physically, I got sick. I'd throw up. Um, I had night terrors. Mentally, it was depression, and uh, I got an, a serious anxiety disorder, which I'm still on medication for. It's very dangerous when an entity victimizes a child because a child is innocent and they can't fight back. They may believe everything the entity tells them. And it's very difficult for a child to recover from that. It becomes very emotionally and mentally traumatizing. Fearing the male spirit was bad enough, but soon a new and terrifying entity also began to appear in the house. My sister told me that she had seen a little girl in white crawling across her floor. And then she stood up with an axe. And my sister like tried to cover herself and, and yelled, and then she disappeared. But this time, Crystal and her sister weren't the only ones to encounter the spirit. My babysitter, she was sleeping on the couch. And she was awoken just by fear. And she woke up and she saw this little girl. She was dressed in overalls with a pink shirt underneath. The little girl had blonde hair, um, blue eyes, and she was really, really, really sad looking. The little girl looked at her and she led her into the basement. And then she turned around and she was, just looked really, really, really sad. And then she just, she was gone. And things would only get worse for Crystal's babysitter. She could hear dragging noises. She said it sounded like uh, my toy chest was being dragged across the floor. So she thought I was up uh, and moving things around. My, my babysitter thought she was being lured into the basement for something evil. She just had a sense of fear and dread of the basement, I think. 
when she went up to check on things to see what was going on, uh, she found my sister in her bed sleeping and me in my bed sleeping in our rooms. When she turned, she got knocked to the ground. Old Crystal Martin and her 13-year-old sister were victimized by evil entities in their home. Soon, even their babysitter fell victim to the violence. And it knocked her out. After she was knocked unconscious, she got up. She didn't know what was going on, so she was, it was dark. It's like paralyzing fear. So she woke us up, took us with her to the hospital, and she ended up with a concussion. I can't stay here anymore. The incident changed my babysitter's thinking about what was going on because she had been knocked unconscious, so she knew that there was something there that was not good. At that point, she did think that something evil was inside the house. The babysitter finally believed her but it proved to be of little comfort for Crystal. I wanted to move out so badly because just all the, the evil things that were happening, the injuries, just the fear that I had gone through, I couldn't take it anymore. When Crystal turned 18, she decided to move out of the house. What got me through the final years in that house was definitely my sister, Carrie. I wouldn't have made it without her. So when I was 18, I got my stuff, moved out. Then the rest of my family uh, ended up moving uh, about a year later. The scariest part of the terrors for me were just how evil they were. It definitely made me believe 100% in the paranormal, from ghosts to demons to um, the fact that they really can hurt you. Those that say that they can't are, are lying. Spirits can accidentally be summoned into the physical world and sometimes those entities are pure evil, with their only intent being to harm the living. Paranormal Survivor, Season 4, Episode 1, Gay's Grueling Ghost. It was an old farm. We are farmers. It sat in the middle of 200 acres. It was very isolated. One day, when I was about 12, My sister, Gail, brought home a spirit board. And I thought, that's not a good idea. I don't like them. You ready? And I could feel an odd energy that went through me when I touched it. I thought, that's just kind of an odd feeling. I don't really want to do this. Come on. Okay, are you ready? Are there any ghosts in here? We were kind of asking it questions like, well, what's gonna happen next? Who's gonna, who's gonna die next? Who's gonna die next? And I thought, how come it's not answering? How did you do that? I, I didn't do that. There just went to goodbye. I don't want it. 
And she was just, uh, I don't want to play with it anymore. And I thought, well, okay. And I had placed it on a dresser in my room. The girls were finished with the spirit board, but the spirit board wasn't finished with them. The next day, the planchette started moving on its own. And I walked over and it stopped. Just bam, no sliding, no nothing, just stopped dead in the board and didn't move. And I thought, well, why is it stopping? Put my hands on it and I ask it a question. What do you want from me? And it sat there and it did not move. It just got shaky. It starts spelling out this odd sentence. I, you, kill. It's threatening me. Spirits can often lie in wait and wait to be invited into a home through a spirit board or other form of divination. And once they're there, they can then become stronger. Soon, the activity in the house wasn't just confined to the spirit board. My sister Gail had woken up. All she said was, get up, my back hurts. Can you see what I did to it? It hurts. <laughs> and she had these three long scratches. <laughs> like something tried to grab your skin. What? I did connect her scratches to the spirit board. I thought it had done this, that it was angry at her, that she wasn't talking to it, or she, we were basically ignoring it. And it was willing to show her, I can do this. What are you going to do about it? Terrified by the attack, Gay's sister decided to take drastic action. She decided that she would burn the spirit board. And when it was gone, the house was a lot lighter, much easier to breathe when you walked in. Their relief did not last long. I was cleaning up the last of the dishes. I was alone in the house that day, and this cup went flying right past me. I didn't see anyone that could have thrown it. And I remember thinking, oh, somebody whipped that at me. Bounced to the floor and I thought, oh, it's gonna be in pieces. And I picked it up and I was looking at it. It should have cracks and everything. And it didn't have anything on it, it was fine. And I thought, but it hit the wall so hard, it should be like in pieces. I thought that was downright strange. and the eerie activity would only escalate into pure terror. I had been sound asleep, deepest sleep I had ever had. And I remember trying to turn over and I realized I was floating and it felt like arms were holding me up. I was just terrified to be eight to nine inches above the bed. I was trying to and I couldn't move my legs. I couldn't make any noise at all when I was floating. I could not yell. It's that sensation of somebody else has control of this and I don't know who they are. I don't know why this is going on. And I was just suddenly dropped onto the bed. So I looked around. Ah! 
13-year-old gay Calhoun and her 15-year-old sister had accidentally summoned a violent entity to their home, and now that spirit was intent on harming gay. There was this really dark shadow. You can't be here! You can't be here! And it had this odd grayness around it. And it would back up, and then it would slowly try to sneak back over towards me. You can't be here! You can't be here! And it was saying some odd things like, I was invited. I was asked. You owe me. The only goal that a demonic spirit has is to wreak havoc on your life and ultimately just take your soul. I went to my sister and I was, hey, help. St. Michael, our angel, defend us against the battle. And she started praying. It was a thunderstorm. One of these flashes of lightning came into the room. It was like on fire. It was so bright. The dark shadow backed up, and then it started fighting it. The spirit hit the dark shadow. It was gone. It was good and gone. It did not come back. The other spirit stepped sideways and disappeared. This wasn't a dream. This wasn't something you dreamed up. This you actually saw. Fearing for their safety, the family called in a priest to cleanse the home. He did the living room, he did the bathroom, all the rooms in the house. He did them all. And he just kind of stopped. And he walked out rather quickly and he left Sage to burn and said, use them. Believe me, use them. When we did our own saging, all the activity stopped. It was quiet. There were no voices, there was no shadows, there was nothing moving. I believe that the paranormal activity was connected to our use of the spirit board. I think that that kind of opened everything up to something else that wasn't there before. If I'd known that it was actually going to cause what happened, or at least open a doorway that allowed something that wasn't part of our house in, I don't think I would have touched it. And I've had people try to coax me into doing it, and I'm just, uh, no. No, I don't want to.